everyone, and welcome back to another episode of One to One Space, where we talk all things architecture and design. As always, I'm joined today by Rod Robotham, CEO and President of One Space. Today we are talking about high rise. Last episode was about mid rise, so there's a trend happening here. But I'm pretty excited about this one because it is a big topic. So let's get into it. First things first. How's it going over there at One Space? I imagine it's quite busy this time of year. It is very busy. Uh, we are at full capacity and still going, still going towards maybe a little bit more capacity. So yeah, we are very busy. So how many projects would you say you have on the go right now? Oh, uh, I, I guess the estimate would be somewhere around uh, 25 or 30 active files maybe. And how many of those are high rise? We have, okay, that's a good question because <laughs> high rise uh -huh. is actually defined as anything over 11 stories. Okay, that was going to be my next question. I know. So <laughs> I would say we probably have at least uh, 10, maybe 12 of those at the moment. The reason why you see the high rise building type in use is because it has a, a a very small footprint area associated with it, but it can accommodate a high population and different uses, uh, you know, retail, office components, and then residential above it. And sometimes they combine uh, residential and, and hotels as well through the body of the building. So um, that's, the, that's the power of the high rise is they take up very little site compared to um, something that's maybe 10 stories or nine stories if the same kind of number of units that would take up an enormous amount of property that's far mm -hmm. more expensive as a purchase a land purchase than something that's you know half an acre or a quarter of an acre or something in that uh, size that has a, a point block tower or a high rise on it so let's get into the setbacks then going off of that comment because we did get into that with mid-rise. If you haven't seen that or listened to that podcast yet, we did do mid-rise condos for podcast four. So go ahead and check that out. Um, but for high-rise, I imagine it's going to be quite a bit different because of the scale. Yeah, it is different. Uh, and, and like mid-rise guidelines, the City of Toronto also has a... Uh, a tall building guideline, which they mm -hmm. issued in 2013. And that, that is a fairly uh, comprehensive um, set of, you know, uh, I guess, general, general guidelines plus rules of thumb that apply to any, any site that's being developed for tall buildings. And um, typically what you have is a, a requirement for uh, Addressing a number of items related to how much sky you can see, uh, what mm -hmm. the setback might be from adjacent buildings, and what what the pedestrian realm is supposed to be uh, at the base of the building. There's a number of these. It's quite intensive. So typically what you have is if you had a, a mid-rise building, uh, for example, on the opposite side of a street, and you wanted to develop somewhere in between uh, on a city block, um, between a taller building and a mid-rise building, mm -hmm. what you'd have to do is you'd have to set up the massing of the building such that it would fall within the general parameters of that guideline. So it means that you may have an angular plane that uh, is something that you have to adopt on your own property because of the adjacency of something else that may be opposite the street. So you may have an, may have an angular plane that applies to you and then you would have to have a limit on the height of your building, and uh, that would have to be in accordance with that angular plane. Uh, in some cases, these angular planes don't apply, so you see very, very tall structures in downtown Toronto, uh, uh, 75, 80 stories uh, in some mm -hmm. cases being proposed. So that's, that's where you basically start. So the space between towers is typically set at 25 meters. Okay, so between you and an existing tower, for example, you would have to allow for a space of, of that distance. And that preserves the natural daylight and provides right. a yeah, provides a view to the sky at street level, uh, which is important because it, it helps benefit that the uh, emotional and mental mental health of the city's occupants when they can see the right. sky. 
Right. Because I was going to say, I would imagine it would be quite dark yeah. if they're so close yeah. together. Yeah, it can. Um, yeah. And you will often see very little setback, for example, along a street like uh, Young Street or Bloor Street. So the building will be right on the property line. And, and there's a reason for that. It's, it's because it's intended to create an, a consistent urban edge right. uh, along the street so that you have a consistent wall of building. And, and that wall will help animate the street. It'll be something that offers you know, uh, openings for retail in some places that might set back for some sculpture. Uh, it'll create maybe a small plaza at the front entrance area where people can gather. But typically that, that wall exists there to create a consistency so you have a, a constant edge um, of, of building along the street. And if, if it's a residential building and in an area that condensed, mm -hmm. I would imagine that the first couple floors would be dedicated to either retail or business because of the condensed atmosphere because you're not going to get as much natural light and it's going to be loud because the traffic and pedestrians and all these things, right? Yeah. Uh, that's what they call a, a mixed use development. So you're mixing up uses of, of retail, business, and residential occupancies. And as I said before, sometimes hotels. Okay. So right. a mixed use building also has a, a component of sustainability uh, to it, which I, I will get to. But um, mm -hmm. Often, just starting out with your own development, you'll have to transition your height at its highest point down to something that is uh, more relevant to uh, a scaled, you know, a lower scaled building that may be adjacent to your property, uh, a park, or right. other other types of open space. And you want that to happen so that the height transitions down to to meet the pedestrian quality of that environment. So right. an open park should have lots of natural sunlight. It should have the ability to, uh, uh, you know, be open in its, in its uh, view to uh, cross the street and to the, the city beyond that kind of thing. So there's typically a transition in height that occurs. Okay. So that actually is one of the first components of how a modern tall building can be sustainable and that it is multi-use. Right. And in being multi-use, it, it prevents urban sprawl. It, right. it provides other uses other than just straight residential use. It provides retail. It provides office space in downtown, more urban environments so that we don't have to build those things beyond the limits of a downtown so that they can be uh, accommodated in a downtown core. And it uh, creates neighborhoods you know, doing that. Yeah. And uh, you'll see all over Canada uh, and pretty much the world that mixed use buildings really do contribute uh, mm -hmm. to that quality of making things available to, to everyone in a city in a very small area. These, these things also mean that you don't have to travel to other destinations. So you may not have to get in the car, you know, to do that. So there's the, there's kind of an awareness of being more environmentally sensitive when right. these buildings offer that kind of a program. So and, sustainability is one topic that we haven't really gotten into too much because it's quite a large topic. Um, so maybe we'll do a podcast about that in the future. Hmm. But so explain to us what the Toronto Green Standard is Okay. And do you so, need to provide this for building applications? What does that mean? And does do you have to adhere to it every time? That's three questions in one. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the 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 green standard means uh, an industry recognized standard of building design, construction, renovation, and or maintenance that typically results in minimized consumption of non renewable energy resources. Right. And the optimum use of sustainable materials. So uh, you really do want to, uh, I mean, I think it is mandatory, but you really do want to pay attention to the Toronto Green Standards because it consists of tiers of performance. Right. And uh, tier one is mandatory, okay? So you do have okay. to meet tier one. And you have to uh, uh, understand that it's applied through the planning approval process. 
Um, and the reason why it's important uh, is because it it forces the development to pay attention to the environmental needs. Yeah. Um, but other otherwise, it's also it comes with a a series of financial incentives. Um, that That's are offered, great. Yeah, that are offered through the development <laughs> charge refund program. So okay. if you're eligible and you're verified for tier two or better, um, that that type of refund is is available to you. So there there are various tiers to the program, tier one being mandatory, but you want to pay attention to the other tier possibility and make sure that uh, in, you know your design team is aware of the direction you want to go in. And and it can be relatively easy to achieve uh, through sustainable materials uh, in the mm-hmm. construction of the building. Right. Um, or limiting the the energy use of the building, thereby <clears throat> lowering its carbon footprint. So when you can do these types of things, uh, you can achieve a Toronto Green Standards. And I think that most municipalities have these types of things in place. And we do have a couple projects, more than a couple projects, <clears throat> that um have gardens on the roof and outdoor patios and they utilize green space up there too. Now right. is that a decision that the architect makes or the developer? I, I think it comes along with creating the vision of the development. Uh, certainly we take the lead on that conversation. So we can mm-hmm. often say, uh, you know, I'd like to propose this rooftop or this area as an outdoor amenity space because we need X square meters or X square feet of amenity, outdoor amenity space for the building occupants because they have to have essentially a, a backyard, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, they also have to have um, sometimes an equivalent area of indoor recreation space. Yeah. And they, the city typically wants you to, to have the two congruent so that they are side by side or easily accessed by from one to the other. And uh, so we typically get into situations where we will take advantage of roofs and sometimes we'll do it to just get the view um, because there's nothing yeah. more powerful or commanding than being on the 50th floor at an outdoor terrace and you have a view to the entire city from there. I mean, um, this yeah. is kind of the allure of the tall building is that they are powerful expressions and they speak to the inhabitants and the, mm-hmm. sometimes the power and importance of those inhabitants um, can can be readily uh, clarified by by the building itself. Yeah, and also a little bit terrifying. <laughs> well, if you're afraid of heights, yes. <laughs> yeah, my husband wouldn't go out there. Yeah. Um, so let's get into the building a bit because if we keep going on sustainability, I love that topic. So we should do a podcast about just that. Um. How much, let's go inside the building here. How much do floor plans change? And is it identical all the way up the building? Because I can imagine, you know, I'm not I'm not an architect or an interior designer, but I can imagine that having to build 300 units or design 300 units, if they're all different, that would take years, right? So let's let's debunk the mystery. <laughs> Well, um, there are various strategies to the number of unit types in buildings and uh, what sizes those are and to what market they they appeal to. That's a whole other uh, dynamic that occurs inside the building. But Mm -hmm. typically the way these buildings work is, you know, the city of Toronto in particular wants the floor plates to vary. And I, I think as designers go, we also want that. To, yeah. um, to vary. For example, they want a very distinct base to the building. Mm-hmm. Then they want a very distinct middle. And the middle is where the floor plan can change first because they predict uh, that the middle of the building, if it has a certain size in width and length, it will have a slenderness to it. Right. So they they restrict the size of the floor plate to 750 square meters, meaning you can't have it bigger than that. Every time. Right. So that follows through with the requirement that it be slender. So the middle of the building is typically no bigger than 750 square meters per floor plan. Now, sometimes they can come in 
Um, but that's the largest size that it can be. And that's that so interesting. Generates, yeah, that generates what's called a uh, point block tower. Okay. Okay. Where the, the two, the two uh, dimensions of the plan, um, X and Y, are very close to the same size. So sometimes they're somewhere around 21, 23 meters each, that kind of thing. And at the center of it, you can have a very, very compact core. Okay. So you have an elevator. Right. And then right behind the elevator, you have the scissor stairs, which go down the building for exiting. And then the rest of it is all suites, and they, they take up all four sides of the building. Yeah. So that that's the middle portion of the building, which have 750 square meters restriction placed upon it. And then they want you to do something distinct at the top, uh, 750. And at the top, they want the top to be designed to make an appropriate contribution to the quality and character of the city skyline, which is a very broad cool. statement, but it gives yeah. an enormous amount of opportunity to do things at the top of the building, which you may not have conceived of when you were just, you know, doing the massing. Yeah. The massing is just a flat box because you're just trying to get the overall uh, parameters, the development parameters in place. And then as you develop it, you can start to look at the guidelines for uh, guidance as to how you can yes. pull the building forward. And then you can look at other things on the building, like uh, the balconies. Right. Because the balconies can project past that 750 square meter restriction. Okay. And you see nowadays a number of buildings in the city of Toronto where the balcony, the shape of it, the length of it as it rises and, and goes up the building's uh, middle section, it changes the overall character of the architecture very, very, very strongly. And you can have a straight glass box with yeah. this very nicely articulated balcony that goes along. Very, yeah. very simple. But it provides an enormous amount of character to the building. And you start to see these all over now. Yes. So that a very simple expression in the balcony edge can make a big difference on how the the architecture reads. It's like art, like yeah. facade art. Yeah. And the other thing you have to maintain, of course, is that 25 meter spatial separation between, let's say, your the own, your own building to maybe a, a another part of it, if it's also considered a tall building, but any ad adjacent structures that might, might exist on the city street. So you have to be 25 meters away from those other buildings, and then you have to be 750 square meters no larger in plant. And then, of course, yeah, balconies can project past that. So, And balconies can also project past the 25 meter? Uh, sometimes they can project into that. Yeah, it depends on it depends Because they're the high, right? Well, they're, they're typically five to seven feet wide or so, yeah. you know, 1.5 to 2.1 meters. And they project beyond the, the enclosing the building face. Right. And uh, sometimes they, they will allow you to... to uh, uh, encroach into the 25 meters. In other cases, they say, no, you can't. Um, so that it really is a, as I said, this is a general guideline. And yeah. okay. each site will be treated differently uh, in discussions with the uh, urban planning department, the city of Toronto. And it just depends, I guess. Yeah. And, and so that that's really why the, the floor plates are, are varying because the base is supposed to establish how the building relates to the neighborhood and yeah. how it relates to the ground. Yeah. And, then, and that's the part as a pedestrian, that, that's the part like the mid-rise building, that's the part you pay attention to because you can see all of the detail in the facade for about 100 feet or so. And at some yeah. point, it starts to fade out of your view. So that's why the middle now can behave differently and the top can behave differently. Um, and it, it's actually a, a technique mm -hmm. of design called tripartite, meaning oh, three tripartite. parts. tripartite. Yeah. Three parts. Base, middle, top. Amazing. Yeah. And so every single project that goes in for rezoning or site plan approval has to adhere to these guidelines. It has to demonstrate how it complies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it sometimes it doesn't have to be done uh, so, I guess, so formally. Sometimes you can you can have a building. Um, I like they they call them the Maryland. Maryland yes. Monroe Towers in Mississauga, uh, where 
there is a distinct bass middle top, but it's somewhat different or, in its articulation. Yeah. It's not quite clear. If you look at uh, more historically uh, significant buildings, um, even like the first one I mentioned there, uh, they have a very, very straight, almost classical bass yeah. middle top. You know, very, very classically designed, rigid lines, and uh, very clear definition of how the three parts of the building are designed. But in modern architecture, you can you can gray that up a bit. You know, you can stray so, from it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Get a little bit more funny business. <laughs> but yeah. if if the 750 square feet, right? Meters. Square meters. Meters. Sorry. Square meters. There, that that's that's where it was. Yeah. But the Maryland Monroe buildings would be in that. Uh, that's the city of Mississauga. I don't know if their standards okay. are exactly the same. I mean, what I'm focusing on today is really what Toronto. the city of Toronto guidelines are. Um, yeah, some municipalities have similar restrictions, and some of them have uh, different different definitions of what a high rise is. Right, because of the density. Well, be or that, or the size of the city. Cool. Right. In smaller, that's so smaller towns, you show them something at five stories and they think that's a tall building. Yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other ball game. Yeah. And so a question for those people that aren't architecture or interior design savvy. To basically really dumb it down. How is the building not falling over? Because well, you can get buildings that are like, as you said, 60 stories high. Well, yeah, How does a uh, big gust of wind not? <laughs> well, you know they're, what designed, I mean? they're designed for wind load. Yeah. They're designed to, well, they're designed to resist wind load. They're designed to resist earthquake movements. And they're designed to resist uh, movements associated with their own weight and the weight of the occupants. And that's why there's a structural engineer on board. Right. So if a building is, for example, made out of poured concrete, all the floors are flat eight inch thick, you know, concrete slabs. The vertical walls that support that at the top might be eight inches thick, mm -hmm. but they might at some point lower down, go out to 12 inches. Yeah. Lower down, go out to 18. Ground floor, they might be two feet wide, depending on the height of the building. And that's all to handle um, the weight of the building and resist all of these other lateral loads, which are coming right. at it from the side. So all of those loads are, are taken and transferred from the top of the building all the way down to the base, right down into the footing. So that's why you see uh, enormous amounts of time being spent on excavation and pouring foundations and footings because they're, they're very big and uh, they take a long time. So you, you can see that a, a, a development will take maybe you know, five, six months just to come out of the ground. Uh, yeah. Depending on how many parking levels there are, you can see it taking a year before it comes to grade. Uh, you know, just because of the parking and the size of the footings and addressing waterproofing and all of those other types of things right. that are required. Well, that's good. That makes me feel good. <laughs> uh, there are some buildings where, although it will not fall down, there is some flexibility to the structure. So you can feel a slight movement if there's an earthquake, which right. we have had. We have had That's in the city of Toronto. Terrifying. Um, yep. I remember. Yeah. They're, they're not super big, though. They're yeah. not like, but you can feel them. You can feel it. Uh, you feel a slight vibration. There's a sense of, uh, you know, your center of balance goes out for a minute. Um, yeah. But you can also feel it in super tall buildings uh, where you have a high wind condition. Sometimes I think you can actually feel the building moving. And so what would be the difference in the structure that's not going to do that and the one that does have a little bit of a wiggle? Well, uh, concrete's pretty rigid. Uh, it's probably the best material to use, although in the city of New York, for example, it's steel that's used almost exclusively there. But uh, oh. steel has a more malleable or flexible um, characteristic. So I think you might be able to feel those buildings move possibly a little bit more. I've never actually thought of that before, but maybe those buildings being less rigid, you might, you might feel them moving around. 
The other thing is that the structural engineers are designing to a factor of safety, which is yeah. a multiple of, you know, two and a half times or some number of what the minimum amount of strength is needed in the building. So they're they're using a factor of safety, which is exceeding. It's not designed to minimum. It's exceeding minimum. Right. Uh, <laughs> just two more questions. Just two more quick questions because... It's been a it's been a long podcast because this is such a good topic. Um, but what things do you typically avoid in your designs um, that aren't geared towards the restrictions and the things that you have to do for the city of Toronto? So you know materials and maybe. Um, a design component that you don't really use? And maybe alternatively to that question, what do you like to use? Well, uh, firstly, I think you have to look at the tall building as, as we said, I think right at the beginning, it, it offers a significant impact to a city environment. It's an icon. It can be a gateway. Uh, it can be a landmark. So, a considerable amount of importance has to go into and care has to go into the design of the building because it can be seen from such a, a long, long distance away. So, you know, we really want to make sure that the building is an elegant uh, sculptural piece, you know, that it, that it has some significance, that it stands the test of time in its design. You know, it doesn't instantly become dated, which uh, materials can... Um, can sometimes they, they can do that. They can date a building yeah. very quickly. So yeah. you, you want to get something that's slender and elegant and it's making a statement. You also want to have something that fits within the context of its neighborhood. You want to do that with any building, but particularly with a, uh, a tall building, I would say, especially at the base, you want to have something that's talking to the context of the neighborhood. Right. Uh, there's there's others that would argue that point and say, well, no, you, if you're going to make a statement, make it a statement. Right. All right. But you still have to meet with the characteristics of the established neighborhood at some point. Right. Right. Um, you want to avoid big, boxy, not well articulated masses that just sit there. They just sit there like a, I don't know. A big, Dead. Fat, a big fat guy. Uh, and, yeah, and, they, yeah. they, and they don't pay attention to uh, what's around them. And they're, you know, right. they, I, there's a, I guess they have a brutalist quality to them. And they're almost like if you think about them as a person, they're somewhat selfish, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but they're not talking to anyone. They're being yeah. very, they're introverted. Right. So they, they come and they I sit there. And, yeah. So that's the kind of, if you think of them as people, I think maybe that's the best way. Yeah. To, Personify. To, yeah. So cool. Uh, and the predominant material is glass. There's a lot of reasons why glass is so popular. There is an economy to it. Uh, it offers floor to ceiling views, which the occupants want. Yeah. They want the daylight, and uh, <laughs> they want you know they want the nighttime view. They want the daytime view. They want to be able to see Lake Ontario. They you know so so you want to have as much glass as possible to to contribute to that experience, but. There are new materials that are coming out that has caught my interest. And one of them is uh, the ability to put solar panels within a glazing, a frame system. So that we have now the ability for uh, the building to generate its own electric power, which I That's think- That's very cool. Which I think is pretty interesting. It, it doesn't look that utilitarian either. It can look like different things, which is kind of interesting because they have this finish in front of it and then these cells in behind and so on. And uh, that technology is a very interesting one. It's coming along. It's changing fairly rapidly. Um, mm -hmm. We used to see a lot of towers done in precast concrete. I think that's kind of gone away. Um, stylistically, it right. was very relevant in the 90s for some reason. Um, but it's a very heavy product and it tends to make a building look very, I don't know. Gray. Uh, yeah, and, and somewhat oppressive, I think, for me Yeah, personally. right, um, right. But there's other products. There's uh, 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 Fiber C, for example, which is like a, uh, uh, like almost like a cementitious product that is um, on, the, on the building facade, which 
you know, has various joints in it. But there's so many different materials that are coming out now that, uh, you know, it's it's something that we pay attention to when we design. So we, we say, you know, listen, we want to have this kind of expression. So what is the most appropriate material that can achieve that? Mm -hmm. And so we'll design with that in mind and uh, articulate the building using that product. And then sometimes we'll do something different at the base. Maybe yep. a really nice dressed stone, or sometimes you get brick in there because you want to talk to the, the neighborhood context through your materials and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> uh, there's all kinds of new materials that are out there. They are, they are more sustainable uh, in yep. some cases than the more traditional materials that we were using. And, uh, it, you know, it's kind of exciting. Metal panels, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, titanium. Uh, uh, I think Gary eventually. Stuff. Right. Yes. Um, I think eventually we'll see all of those materials being utilized more and more in yeah, everybody's I, designs, not just ours, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, uh, we're, Hopefully. We're, we're one of many that are involved in these types of buildings. And uh, we're all drawing from the same palette. Uh, typically, we all draw from a, the same pool of manufacturers, and and it's how you put it together that, uh, uh, in your own unique way, that that defines the character of the building. Yeah, well, let's let's finish off with my my last question because I think we could talk all day about high rise because <laughs> they're so interesting and there's so many in the city of Toronto. Um, but out of the buildings that you have designed or worked on. Uh, which high rise, which one space high rise is your favorite? Oh, you always ask me to pick a favorite. Um, yeah, I, I kind of, I have mine. I have an idea of what maybe yours is, but. Uh, there's a, there's a building that we just designed recently for the city of Brampton. That's 39 stories. Um, that I, I took in a slightly different way than I think we have done before. Because you don't want to repeat yourself. It's uh, not very rewarding to anyone. Right. Um, yes. So I think that at the moment, that might be the most interesting building uh, that I think I've designed in the last year or so. <clears throat> but however, we are we are working on uh, some other high-rise buildings now. And I, I'm always looking for the next one. So I will design one today and then think that the next one I do is actually better than that. I, and I guess right. it's just the, the the pursuit of creativity which drives that print that opinion. But yeah, uh, it's hard to say if there's a favorite at the moment. Um, and they all have their own little stories too. So when you remember designing that building, you think about the stories that go along with with it. And if it was a really fun and pleasant experience, then you'll tend to think that that's your favorite. Yeah. <laughs> in some yeah. in some cases, that it it may not have been. Uh, there may not have been anything that stood out particularly during the creativity of that, or you may have struggled with the design of it for several months. Some of these things come very easily, you know, like you wake up and you go, I think it should look like this. And 10 minutes later, you're, you've kind of got the whole idea figured out. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, hard very to cool. believe at times, but it does happen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I would, I would say that the, that building in Brampton right now is probably one of my favorites of, of, you know, the last, I'm going to say 10 years. Well, I think that wraps up today's podcast number five. We've done five so far. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and I think we have some topics for next time, maybe environmental design, sustainability, who yep. knows, yep. townhomes. We haven't done that one yet. Nope. Haven't done that one. Haven't done that one. So there's three topics right there. Well, thank you so much for chatting to me, us, about High Rise. And uh, you go design some more buildings. <laughs> we need some more. <laughs> Toronto's not dense enough, it seems. No. Every there's time always I, more. Every time I see a parking lot, I think, oh, you know what? There, we there's could, a... We could, we could put a building there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's still lots. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was uh, much younger in the city of Toronto was, I would say, in its infancy, mm -hmm. uh, you would see a lot of surface parking lots downtown. Right. And, you know, by just virtue of habit, every time you went downtown, you would go to the same parking lot and you would park there. 
Well, yeah. within the last 10 to 15 years, I've had to learn that, oh, yeah, that's not there anymore. <laughs> yeah, and now you have to pay $25 an hour and go under a building. Yeah, so you have sometimes you have to park underneath the building that, that now sits on the parking lot. Or, yeah, sits on the parking yeah. lot. This is why anyway, I live this, in the country. This is the nature of progress. It is. It is. Okay, well, until next time, thank you, everybody, for listening or watching, whichever one you're doing, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.